never mind the jailhouse blues. Here at Emery Knoll Farms in Street, Maryland, they've got the greenhouse blues. All of our greenhouses are named after blues singers. I always thought it was very impersonal to just have letters and numbers for greenhouses. And that's not the only personal touch you'll find on this former grain farm turned nursery. From peculiar planters to hidden helpers, even the plants themselves resemble tiny works of art, especially those inside the farm's research and development greenhouse. In here we have plants from uh, all over the world. Nicknamed Van Morrison, the R&D greenhouse serves as a library for all of the plants that the farm sells and a lab for many more exotic varieties that fifth-generation farmer Ed Snodgrass brings back from his travels around the globe. I'll show you this plant, which is a lithops from southern part of Africa, made to live in very, very dry climates. These photosynthesize inside through this little window. They're called baby toes. You won't find these strange succulents in the farm's catalog, but whether they're actually on the market or just being researched for their potential, all of these plants have one thing in common. Everything here maybe has a, a roof in mind somewhere in the world. Yep, you heard that right. Emery Knoll was the first nursery in the country to focus exclusively on plants cultivated to grow on rooftops. And Ed, well, he's kind of a leader in the industry. Green roofs are a way of putting back vegetation in a city. Obviously, roadways are out, sidewalks are out. So rooftops offer a lot of area in a city to revegetate. But green roofs are about a lot more than prettying up dull slabs of concrete. The big market driver in this region is stormwater management. Unlike forests and meadows, which soak up rainwater, urban surfaces, like concrete and asphalt, do the opposite. So when you change from forest to city, you have this enormous amount of water that now is not being absorbed into the landscape. You get localized flooding. It carries pollutants directly into rivers. And in rapidly developing regions like the Chesapeake Bay watershed? It gets into billions and trillions of gallons of water that heretofore didn't have to be managed. Enter green roofs. If you revegetate part of the city, you put some of that absorptive function back in. When Ed first launched the business in the late 90s, customers were few and far between. It was kind of right at the beginning of the green roof industry. But today, their plants are on roofs across the country, and their employees are busy meeting that demand by propagating, propagating, propagating. Mostly hardy succulents and grasses. Most people are real gentle with their plants, and you don't have to be gentle with these at all. Good thing, too, considering where they're headed. We are growing plants that are growing in a really gravel-based media and maybe four inches on top of a building. So it's a very harsh climate. Heavy winds, cycles of flooding and drought, and in most cases, a lot less tender loving care than your front yard flower beds, which is why this nursery doesn't peddle plants without scrutiny. We're looking at plant longevity, plant survival, drought tolerance, and things that, that have good pollen and nectar sources for insects. The latter is a relatively new area of study at Emory Knoll, and it's by no means the only new area. There's a whole field that's coming up where we're using plants and biological systems to replace what used to be mechanical and civil engineering systems, and removing pollutants using plants, cooling cities, having tighter connections between production and consumers. Sounds like nature itself may hold the key to a more sustainable future, especially if people like Ed and his team continue to push the envelope. It's really, really interesting time for agriculture and horticulture. 